Hi, I'm Avery Davidson. And I'm Kristen Oaks-White. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Well, you've almost certainly seen them along roadways, forests, and possibly even in your yard. Dead pine trees seem to be everywhere, and they are a threat. As Twyla's Neil Malasson tells us, there's a legislative effort underway to get help with removing these trees before they come down on their own. Mike Johnson isn't liking what he's seeing. Despite removing several pine trees from his property in Pineville, more of his pines are going to have to be removed after dying from last year's weather. Those were trees that have died since I had seven more removed. And uh, my, my hope when I removed the seven was that, that that would stop it, but it hasn't. Johnson says while he had the means to remove them himself, many in the state do not. That's why he's formed the Emergency Pine Beetle Subcommittee to see whether or not homeowners and municipalities can get some help to get these trees down. And the average Louisiana citizen can't afford that. This is an unanticipated cost that, that is unavoidable because what we heard from the hearings just two weeks ago from, from, from some of the experts from LSU is that it's not a matter of if these trees will fall, but 100% of these trees that are infested will fall. The culprit killing these big trees is this little beetle. Known as the Ips beetle, there are several variants that feed on dead and dying trees. Jim Meeker, an entomologist with the U.S. Forest Service, says last year was a feast for them like he's never seen. It'll attack typically on the bark plates. You'll notice there are cracks and crevices in the bark, but Ips beetles attack on the plate where the bark is thickest and you usually get a pitch response if there's any sort of defense left in the living tree and it'll form a globular pitch tube or resin blob and what we were seeing last summer uh, and late fall and into the winter that there was no pitch tube response whatsoever. Normally, the pressure inside these trees from the sap keeps the beetles out, but with the drought, there was nothing stopping them from entering even still living trees. The good news is the beetles have died from their once boom. It just continued to escalate month by month by month and basically seemed to peak in January of 2024. 20, and since then, with the return of frequent and, and relatively abundant above normal rainfall, the beetle situation has basically crashed. It's not a question of if, but when these trees come down, according to LFA Executive Director Buck Vandersteen. Now, if you're a 40-acre landowner and have experienced a complete loss of trees because of the drought, it is a significant thing. But to forest in total, we're going to be okay. The biggest impact, the biggest impact we see is along homeowners' property, along power line rights of way, road rights of way, where these trees that have succumbed and are and have died. Johnson says in the meantime, his committee will continue seeking help, but if you have the means, remove dead trees as soon as you can. A couple of years ago when the hurricanes came through, we were without electricity for one, two, or three weeks. From all estimations from the utilities, the Public Service Commission, if, if just a fraction of these trees fall in the next hurricane, we could be out twice as long from electricity. It can cost $2,000 or more to remove a tree of this size, and that's a lot, especially if you have two or three dead trees on your property. It's a lot for taxpayers to pick up as well, but you have to ask what the cost will be when these trees eventually do fall across roadways, houses, and power lines across the state. Reporting from Pineville, I'm Neil Malasson. The next meeting of the Emergency Beetle Subcommittee will be on Wednesday, August 14th at 1 p.m. in House Committee Room 3. Some keen-eyed history buffs may have noticed where Neil was standing in his story, the original site of LSU. It started in Pineville as the Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. If you've never heard of it, it's okay. It only lasted 10 years. As you can see, there was an extensive building where the U.S. Forest Service now calls home. A fire destroyed the building in 1869, after which it was moved to Baton Rouge and became LSU. You can see the remains of the bricks where some of the dorms were at that time. Also on the site is a historical marker to George Mason Graham, considered the father of LSU, who drew up plans for the buildings as he sailed down the Mississippi on a steamboat. A walking trail and several education markers are on the grounds, which is open to the public. 
it is my pleasure to introduce you to a visitor who's here from Arkansas, Senator John Bozeman, who is the ranking member on the Senate Ag Committee. Thank you so much for joining us on This Week in well, Louisiana Agriculture. thank you for having us. It's great to be in our neighboring state. You know, and, it's all uh, part of the big boot, right? We like you guys and us, we're playing you. <laughs> well, that's only in the fall and <laughs> spring, so right now we're friends. Tell me a little bit about why you came here to Louisiana to talk to Louisiana farmers and ranchers here at the Louisiana Farm Bureau about the issues they're facing. Yeah, we've been to 20 some odd states throughout the country and I, I believe with all of my heart that the answer to our problems need to be solved from the ground up. Uh, you know, we have hearings in Washington, that's great. There's simply no substitute for getting out, talking to farmers, talking to the producers and understanding the challenges that, that they're facing. And right now they're facing a lot of headwinds. What are some of those challenges and what changes do you think need to be made to the Senate's version of the Farm Bill to address those challenges sort of in the way it is in the House Bill? Well, the biggest, the biggest challenge we're facing right now is the fact that we're operating under a 2018 Farm Bill. The world was totally different then than it is now. And in fact, the 2018 Farm Bill was based on 2012 data, which again is totally different. So what we've got to do is update it. We've got to make sure that the risk management tools are in place. We've got to make sure that farmers have the ability uh, through the marketing programs to, to get trade going again. Research is so, so very important and then the conservation programs. But the basis of it all is the risk management tools. Farmers have to have the ability to know over the next five years that they have the certainty that they'll be able to go to the bank, borrow the money that they need in order to go forward. You talk about the risk management. I mean, southern agriculture is unlike agriculture anywhere else in the country. I mean, we can have a single hurricane, a single weather event right at harvest. And traditionally, those risk management tools have not been able to catch that. Do you think that there's any change that can be made to help with that? Well, I think disaster management is a problem now. It has been, I think, more of a problem in the South than years, year, years ago. Now, because of the climate, the way it is now, uh, we're in a situation we're seeing that all over the country. Congress is pretty good about providing relief. The trouble is, by the time we pass a bill, decide we're gonna pass a bill, get it passed, that might take a year, and then you have the, uh, it has to be set up by USDA, how they're gonna distribute it, and then they have to get the money. It might be two years after the event. That's too long, you know, and, and people that are in dire circumstances, it just makes it that much di more difficult. So, uh, again, that's something that we need to work on and, and in a very bipartisan way to figure out how we can do a much, much better job of that and provide the protection that our producers desperately need. I think everyone knows that this is a presidential election year. It's a big federal election year. Um, with that being the case, how do you feel or do, what do you think the chances are we can get a farm bill passed this year? Well, I think, you know, we're working in good faith. And, and the good news is, is I visit with individual members of Congress, both on the House side and the Senate side. Most people want to get a farm bill done. It's, it's, for most of our states, it's the biggest economic driver in the state. So for lots of reasons, you know, there's, there's momentum that way. On the other hand, when you look at the calendar, uh, literally with the election and things and the summer recess, we're only gonna be there another four weeks or so. So it, it's gonna be difficult to get done before the election. Then the lame duck will come where we have a session. And a lot of good things get done there although you might have a, you know, a transition. So it's, it's pretty murky, but we need to get this thing done as quickly as possible. We need to give the farmers and ranchers throughout the country the certainty that they need uh, as, they go, as they go on. And, and again, facing high, as I said earlier, headwinds in a sense, very high input costs, commodity prices have gone down, and uh, it, that's, a, that's a terrible combination. Yeah, certainty is important. And certainty. also, uh, before I let you go, I have to hit you up with one other bit of certainty. I know Mark Isbell over there in Arkansas grows some rather uh, unique uh, varieties of rice. 
What are you going to tell him whenever you go back to Arkansas and you say that you've had the best rice in the world by coming to Louisiana? Well, I'm not, <laughs> it, it, it will depend on where I'm at as to where the best rice is. <laughs> but I, uh, they grow pretty good rice. Oh, Mark, they grow Mark excellent is, rice. You know, Mark's just a great example of a young farmer that is, is very uh, forward-thinking. Mm -hmm. thinks outside the box and and really is doing a good job as as far as being a great steward of the land which is so important as do almost all of our farmers and he's got great connections here in Louisiana Senator John Bozeman thank you so much for joining us here on this week in Louisiana agriculture so as you heard hoping to get a farm bill passed this year but it most likely would not happen until the lame duck session Kristen back to you thanks Avery well, the National Junior Angus Association connects young people from across the country with their common interest, Angus cattle. Much like the Louisiana Farm Bureau's Young Farmers and Ranchers program, it's a starting point for their future. This year, the NJAA annual lead conference brought them to Louisiana. Twyla's Josh Meeks caught up with them, spicing up their tour of the state. For more than 150 years, every single bottle of Tabasco hot sauce in the world has come from right here in Avery Island. It's one of the biggest success stories in agriculture and a huge piece of Louisiana's impact on the world. That's why Lainey LaBeouf wanted to share it with her fellow NJAA members. I love it. Um, like I said, different cultural things. I think that is something that is so important in our generation growing up is, you know, jumping out of your comfort zone and going and trying new things, meeting new people. The National Junior Angus Association chose Louisiana for its annual lead conference. That's leaders engaged in Angus development. These dozens of teens and young adults are all rooted in the cattle industry, but the NJAA helps connect them with the rest of the world. I think perspective is huge, and so it's a huge learning opportunity for them at a young age to just even see what kind of agriculture is out there and expand their horizons. Madeline Bauer is the NJAA Senior Events Coordinator. She says Louisiana's unique agriculture industry is what brought them here for this year's conference. I think the culture down here in Louisiana is a huge um, perspective to be provided to our juniors um, and the uniqueness of the agriculture and the culture in itself. Just as these bottles of sauce move through to be sent across the world, these kids are getting ready to take their next bold steps. One of my future goals is to leave an impact on the ag industry and the Angus Association has done so much for me. It's given me opportunities to come and meet industry professionals. It's given me the opportunity to meet new people in general. Rosalind Kidwell is an NJAA member from Indiana. She hopes to take what she's learned here and become an ag pharmacologist. But not all of these kids will continue with careers in agriculture. For instance, Slaney is studying midwifery, but she says that doesn't mean she's leaving the farm behind. I will never leave agriculture behind. It's been a part of my life. My dad showed cattle and my mom showed pigs. So growing up, they were in the agriculture industry. So growing up in that, growing up in a farm, it's hard to leave that behind. It's something that has my heart. Reporting from Avery Island for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Josh Meeks. Their statewide tour also brought them to the LSU Rural Life Museum in Baton Rouge and McGee's Swamp and Airboat Tours in Henderson. Still to come on Twyla, join me in Abbeville for our Feasting on Agriculture segment to take a closer look at this season's rice harvest. And later, farmers going for the gold, but not in Paris. You've got to see this guy's moves. You're watching This Week in Louisiana Agriculture the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Welcome to Feasting on Agriculture. I'm Kristen Oaks-White and today we're in Abbeville, Louisiana, where they're right in the middle of rice harvest and we're going to head over to Alan McLean's farm to see how rice harvest is going so far. Feasting on Agriculture is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, Louisiana Crawfish, Ask Before You Eat, and by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, Beef, It's What's for Dinner and by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Think rice. The hardest thing about growing rice in South Louisiana is really mother nature. You don't know what she's gonna throw at you one day. There can be a forecast can say it's clear blue skies and next thing you know, you get an inch of rain. My name is Alan McLean Jr. and I am a rice farmer in Abbeville, Louisiana. This is a completely different harvest than we had last year where we were in a drought. We were just blowing and going straight through. Um, 
rice was almost burning up in the fields because it was so dry and it was ripening so fast. Where this, this is almost um, an average season to get started. You, we'll have rains, we'll have times where we can't harvest, but it's just in times there's been a lot of localized flooding in certain areas, which hinders those areas a little more. This rice is not fully developed yet, so what we're doing is we're just going into the fields and we'll check, see if there's any disease coming up, how the, the healthiness of the plant, just like we're doing in some of the riper stuff. But this right here is, we're just kind of looking, checking, making sure everything's good. There's nothing that need, we need to be alarmed about for uh, a healthy uh, ratoon crop. Now we're starting to, since it's headed out, we're looking to check for the, uh, the ratoon crop to see how it's gonna progress. The healthier the plant, the better and more uh, suitable it'll be for uh, another crop of, and harvest of rice. The rice right here is still actually coming out of the stem. So what it'll do, it'll start at the bottom and it'll just push its way all the way out. And if you start to pull it open, help it along, there's rice all in here that hasn't made it out yet. In another couple of days, it'll be all the way out. Once it's all the way out, it's gonna start to turn down and then it ripens and then it's ready to harvest. As harvest goes through the field, the header cuts the grain off of the plant and it separates the good seed from the bad seed, as in a, a seed that's not fully produced. Only the good seed goes into the hopper, the, the combine. To get it out of the hopper, the big auger on the side opens up and then more augers will push it into the cart right here in front of us. And then from there, it's the same thing, an auger system that puts it into the trucks and off to the mill and the bins uh, for drying and milling purposes it goes. The rice season so far has been uh, very demanding. It is a uh, harvest is starting up right now. The yields that have been coming in have been very good. We, uh, we were able to get the crop in early and timely rains split the crop a little bit. Adequate rain has helped in areas and right now the uh, rain is kind of hindering on the uh, harvest. If the rice is ripe, it starts raining too much, it'll start falling and you'll be losing yields um, and it just hinders and ruts up the fields for a ratoon crop, a second crop of, of rice. And, uh, but all we can do is uh, keep moving forward. We're lucky because the, the rice is a very, um, a very tough crop that can handle a lot of rains in certain times of the growing season. This is just for us a time where we would prefer to see it a little drier where we can get in the fields and harvest a little more uh, steadily. Now that we've harvested some of that rice, we're gonna head back to Alan's camp at Latere Lodge, where we're gonna cook up a dish with rice and crawfish you don't wanna miss. Stay with us. My favorite thing with this segment is when I find a farmer who is willing and can cook something that they've grown, and we've got not one but two things. Absolutely. Rice and crawfish that is straight from your farm. Straight from the farm. And you're going to make a dish for us today, so tell me about it. We're going to do a crawfish and rice casserole. People think it's, oh, we can't cook. If you can't cook this, there's no help for you. <laughs> well, I have an intuition that you're a pretty good chef, so show me how you make this dish. All right, we're gonna put in some butter, get that melting, and then while it's melting, we're gonna dump in our onions, bell peppers, celery, and garlic. And Kristen cut all of this fresh this morning. Yes, yes I did. <laughs> fresh from the freezer. Oh. Aha. Other secret. Uh, other little quick garlic. This is just something quick and easy that it'll go a long way 
You can serve it as a side dish. You can serve it as a main dish. You can change it up. If you don't want to put crawfish, you can put shrimp. Uh -huh. I know people that they won't put the meat, but they'll put like a, a broccoli in it and do a broccoli cheesy rice. Yeah. This is pretty special because you've grown two of the main ingredients. Absolutely. We uh, caught all the crawfish, caught them fresh, um, and then the heart rice, we, uh, we grew and harvested and Supreme mills it, and that's just the end product. The onions are about done. We're going to add in some cheese, some cheddar cheese soup, and some cream of mushroom. And then we're going to add in two cans of Rotel. And Those are good. We're going to do some sliced and diced. Pimento. Pimento. Couldn't get the name right. And we're going to bring, mix, incorporate all of that. Put a little Worcestershire. So you peeled these yourself? We peeled these last night. Those are beautiful. We ended up just saying, let's do something fresh. And then we're going to add in the rice. As a consumer, what you need to be looking for in the grocery stores is where does your rice come from? It's real important to us that you eat local rice. We have mills that mill it and send it across the country. And that's our, I guess, pride. And I mean, we feed it to our families also. So why wouldn't you want to eat something that the farmers are growing and feeding their family with? You don't even need to cook it. I can eat it just like this. Now we're just going to put it in a baking tin. And then this will go into the oven for 30 minutes at 350. OK, simple enough. And whenever you come out, ready to eat. Alan, thank you so much for having us out. I know this is the busiest time <laughs> of year for you, and I thank you for making time for us. Absolutely. This looks wonderful. If you want to learn more about La Terre Lodge, book a stay. Absolutely. You can book a stay. We'll put a link on our website. Thank you so much for showing us all of your ingredients that you put so much hard work into. So the proof is in the pudding. Let's taste it. Awesome. Quick, simple, and easy. Alan, thank you so much. This was excellent. Until next time, we'll see you on Feasting on Agriculture. Feasting on Agriculture was brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef, it's what's for dinner. And by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Think rice. You grow them together, crawfish and rice, you just cannot beat cannot. that. Well, time now for this week's Twyla Boost, and it's appropriate considering the 2024 Olympic Games are underway. And next on the balance beam, Farmer Paul. Paul Nove of Loosedale, Mississippi, showed off his pretty impressive skills up on his fence. His daughter, Lindsay, posted this video online where it's been watched more than 17 million times. Yeah, I don't have that kind of balance <laughs> at all. Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll sit down with rancher turned sheriff Jason Smith of Washington Parish. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twylatv.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also find all of these stories on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and turn the notifications on so you know exactly when we put out new content. For all of us here at Twyla, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.